Habarigani, my brothers and sisters, and greetings once again to another day in the celebration of Kwanzaa. Today we celebrate principle number six, Umba creativity. Tonight's presentation is being sponsored by the Samuel L. Smith Educational Foundation and the National Juneteenth Observance Foundation of Nevada. I'm your host, Dr. Al Gurrier, and over the past five nights, we've reviewed the principles, symbols, goals, and objectives, the history, and the background of Kwanzaa, a celebration of family, community, and culture, created by Dr. Milana Karingi in 1966. Tonight, I'd like to do something a little different. As I go through my Kwanzaa process, I look at the past, plan for the future, and live today. And I'd like to do that in a creative or Kumba way today, utilizing my God-given talents as we share and reflect on the principle of Kumba. And Dr. Karinga says it's to do always as much as we can in any way we can in order to leave our community more beautiful and beneficial than we inherited it. It's the sixth principle of Kwanzaa, Kumba, creativity. It logically follows and is required by the principle of Nia, our first prin uh, principle of uh, last get together. And of course, each principle has a very unique and specific meaning. And as we have gone through the principles this week, each night we spent some time discussing what each principle meant to us as individuals, what it means to us as a family, and how we're supposed to use the information and knowledge we gather from the concept of the principle of the day to better prepare us to live the good life. For Umba is a commitment to being creative within the context of the national community vocation of responding of our people to their traditional greatness and thus leaving our community more beneficial and beautiful. Each generation is charged with this responsibility and is inherited by it. The principle has both a social and spiritual dimension and is deeply rooted both in social and the sacred teachings of African society. So tonight, I have decided to go on a Kaumba journey. Looking at the past, and in the past few days, as we've celebrated our various principles of Kwanzaa, we have looked to the past. As a matter of fact, um, we went back as far as near 300,000 years, which is about the time that modern man is believed to have been on this earth. And we talked about the fact that uh, archeologists and anthropologists say that the very first woman to walk, the first human being to walk this word, earth, the first man, as they say, was actually a woman and her name was African Eve. And tomorrow night, I'm going to be uh, doing a Kwanzaa for children. And part of uh, the responsibility that I'm gonna give them in their participation of tomorrow night's celebration is that they make an effort to go back and recapture their past and for, for all of us, there's a different way, a different method 
for us to begin the study of self. And I'm going to suggest to the children that they talk with their grandparents or aunts or uncles or elders in their home or in their community and ask them about where they're from and what was the experiences that they've had in their life and ask them who their parents and who their grandparents were. And that's how we start the, the journey to develop a knowledge of self. As I've indicated at the conclusion of uh, my presentations, each night I talk about the importance and significance of knowledge of self. And I actually say that I, I believe that there is no more potent or powerful knowledge that you can acquire in life than knowledge of self. Well, in study of self is one of the ways that we develop and identify our kumba. Um, when we talked about uh, cooperative work and responsibility, I talked about us doing the work and I'm going to talk with this about to young people tomorrow I'm going to tell them we all have to do the work we know what the principles are we know what they stand for we discuss them we talk about them but talking is cheap we need action and the action we need is work and that's what we have to do as a people we have to take the principles of Kwanzaa and incorporate them into our lives. So tonight, uh, what I would like to do is take the principles of Kwanzaa that we've reviewed during the past few days and put them in context with my life personally and my talents and share them with you. I'm gonna do that in two ways. First of all, uh, I'm gonna do it in the Umba way of, first of all, as we do in Kwanzaa, study the past. So just as I've started sharing information with you about our history and our people, I'm gonna spend a little more time today going in depth about our, our history and significant components of our culture in order that we can have a better understanding of just what a great creative people we are. And as a teacher, I, I say often, we become what our parents are. And we are the children and descendants, I will say to the children, we are the descendants of kings and queens to whom monuments built thousands of years ago in Mother Africa still exist. So our session today, focusing on Kuumba creativity, you will have the opportunity of being exposed to the Kuumba of Dr. Al Gurye. And as I said during our one of our previous sessions, in talking about education, and that's what this process is, it's all about education from the womb to the tomb. And as we talk about education, there, there are two ways that we acquire an education. One through the halls of learning, school, and I've talked about my terminal degree that didn't teach me as much as I needed to know to really become self-actualized. And the other is the experiences of life. So tonight, I'm gonna take some personal liberty and combine those two together. As far as creativity is concerned, and in particular, as I said the other day, that as a teacher, I think ideally, to be successful at being a teacher, and I was a school principal, and I, I used this approach uh, to my job, and I did the work. I felt that 
to be an effective school, there were two things that we need to do and incorporate into our school. Number one, we need to make a concerted effort to see that every human being who comes into our school begins to realize the worth and value of themselves. So it's of paramount importance that schools uh, help children to develop a good, strong, positive self-image, to feel good about themselves. And unfortunately, the system of education in place, as I've elaborated upon b before, but I, I won't extensively elaborate tonight, the system has failed to tell us about just what a wonderful and beautiful people we of African descent are. So in order to acquire the knowledge and information you have to really feel good about yourself, you're really going to have to make an effort yourself to go back and fetch it. That's called the process of Sankofa, go back and fetch it. So one, schools must build the positive self-image of students. And the second thing that schools must do is help youngsters to develop saleable skills. Now, ideally, the, the, the best students we can produce are students who are confident, self-assured, believe in themselves, and then leave school having developed the talent that God gave them to make a place in society. Now, a lot of times the, the talent that God gives us is not readily available. And it's something that maybe is latent in life and we learn and develop and identify later in life. But the school, at the, while they may not necessarily be able to identify the God-given talent of every, children, of every child, they could help that child develop saleable skills that they could go into the world and sell. So based on those two concepts, I think that's what the ideal school ought to be about. And I, I have incorporated so have incorporated those skills into my life and into my life's work as a teacher. So tonight, as I approach Kwanzaa 2020, night six, Kuumba, I'm gonna use my creativity in sharing with you my Kwanzaa tonight. I'm gonna to start by picking up where we had started early, earlier and talking about us and our past in our history. And history does repeat us itself. There's nothing new under the sun. So it's very important that we know and understand something about ourselves and our history. And as I indicated, uh, I started off um, around 300,000 years ago. We talked about African Eve and I, I worked my way up to uh, around 3200 BC where um, writing was uh, first developed and in past nights we've talked about uh, luminaries, particularly uh, significant African in uh, our history and uh, tomorrow night when I speak with youngsters I'm going to focus on I Am Hotep. And I Am Hotep um, was a, a great teacher, a historian, he was a doctor, he was an architect, and he is credited with being the builder of the Great Pyramids. Now, I, we've talked about other facets of African history and culture, and, I, and that's where I'd like to pick up tonight to, to begin our session tonight. Utilizing my uh, creative ability, I, I've written a little passage and I am gonna, I'm gonna call it most of the information that I've shared with you, uh, particularly about Africa has been BC, that means before Christ. Well, now I, I, I feel it's important that we move ahead and develop um, a, a little clearer picture of some of the facts and 
I, I know it would be unrealistic for, for me to make an effort to, to give you uh, a comprehensive history uh, of what we, the wonderful African people have given, not just to, to the continent of Africa, but to the world. So I, I took a slice of our contributions and I called it BK on the sixes, before Kaumba on the sixes. And I start around the year 600. And it's around that time, two significant things we see happening in Africa around 600. Uh, first is the rise of the kingdom of Ghana. And this is 600, the year 600 AD. That today we have just started 2021 AD. So now I'm talking about the year 600. And uh, we see the rise of the empire of Ghana. And um, that takes place around 600. Also, in that century of the, the uh, 600 year, um, another really significant thing happens that Islam takes hold in Northern Africa. So uh, during the 600s, we see uh, it, Muhammad, uh, who is uh, born during that period, and begins the uh, Islam religion that spreads throughout Northern Africa. And we move ahead in, in on the sixes and we go to 1326. And here in the year 1326, Mansa Musa, who uh, went on a jihad in 1326, that means he was going on a, a holy journey to Mecca. And he was the ruler at that time. And he was tr traveling to Mecca from West Africa. And he was a man who believed when you travel, you should take your friends and your enemies because you should keep your enemies close to you. So in 1326, Mansa Musa and 60,000 people made a jihad to Mecca. The next number on the sixes, oh, and by the way, Mansa Musa was the um, nephew of Sundiata. We, uh, we talked a few days ago about the, the various uh, great epics of the world and I, I indicated that uh, in, in my uh, education I, I had learned about the ep all the major epics of the world, the uh, Spanish epic El Cid, the English epic Beowulf, the French epic Charmaine, the German epic the Nebogulum League, the uh, Greek and Roman epics, the Iliad, the, uh, the, the Aeneid, and the Odyssey, and all of these great stories about all of these, the, the uh, epic is a story about a hero. So all of these stories were about great heroes from all of these European countries. But I was never taught about the African epic, and it's called Sundiata, and it is the, the story of Sundiata and his rise from a family of a, being a slave to becoming a great ruler in Africa. Well, he was uh, the great uncle of, of Mansa Musa, who, like his uncle, became a great and powerful leader in Africa. In 1466, the empire of Sanghe is established and run by one of the fiercest warriors in West Africa, and his name was Sunni Ali. And the, the empire of Songhe lasted for many years. Uh, it, it was so developed till 
one of the uh, great universities of Western Africa. We talked uh, a couple of days ago about all of the, uh, the, the empire with very widely developed education system that included colleges and universities. Uh, for example, we mentioned the University of Saint Gray, uh, the the University of Mali, uh, the U University of Timbuktu, and I te I took one of the first uh, major centers of learning uh, ever in the world, uh, which was open in the city of Luxor. Well, in the in the empire, we're talking about the year 1466. The empire of Songhe was one of those empires that developed university cities. Also around this time, we see the first sale of Africans as slaves. And I'm talking about African slaves being taken off the African continent originally as early as 1446. So in 1446, uh, we began to see the process of enslavement of African people by Europeans. So, um, of course, the, the most significant date for us is 1619. And in 1619, 20 African slaves landed at Jamestown. And Malcolm X was right because a year later, Plymouth Rock landed on us. The pilgrims, according to the history books when I was in school, landed at Pilgrim Rock in 1620. In one thing I, 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 I'd like to mention, uh, I'd like to go back to 1566. And in 1566, African slaves helped to establish the first city in the United States of America. And it's ironic because the first city in the United States was called, was named after an African, St. Augustine, one of the great doctors of the Catholic Church, who was an African, who was a black man. In 1661, the state of Virginia recognized slavery as legal. Both New York and New Jersey also adopted slavery as a legal issue in the 1660s. In 1776, as we do our BK on the Sixes for our Kuumba celebrations of Kwanzaa today, in 1776, the United States declared its independence by saying all men are created equal. Never before had the saying words have meaning be truer or have better meaning for us as a people. The, the, People who were living in the United States in 1776 declared themselves free and independent from the British rule. And they said that they were doing that based on the premise that all men are created equal. Yes, I paused so we could think about that today. And we're at a day and time in our life when we must give that some serious thought. And hopefully with the current election we've just had in, in these United States, 
and the impending election uh, next week that will determine the balance of the Senate, uh, maybe we can really get to the point where we can live out the true meaning of that creed. And we, those of us who have embraced the principles of Nguzu Zaba, will be in position to share with this nation the kind of principles that we feel are appropriate to live by in order that we can live the good life. And I speak of the principles of Nguzu Zaba. We continue in our study that one year later, after the establishment of the independence of the United States, Vermont actually abolished slavery. The writings of Phyllis Weekly had been published in Europe in that same year, 1777. In 1816, the United States began a series of wars to subdue Seminole Indians and re-enslave African Americans. At that time, the, the Seminoles were, were pri primarily inhabited uh, areas, uh, including the state of Florida and Georgia, and they were a very powerful uh, nation. The territory at that time at the time of the independence of the United States, or uh, this particular type year, we're talking about 1816, that area was not even considered part of the United States yet. Uh, and the United States was having trouble with the Seminole Indian tribe. And w one of the main problems that the United States had with the Seminole Indians was the fact that they were acting as a harbor and giving refuge to African slaves who were escaping plantations, running away, and then joining Indian tribes. So the United States made an effort to suppress them by uh, starting wars. And when they found that they were not effective in that process, the United States actually ended up buying the territory of Florida from Spain. Moving along in our BK on the Sixes, in 1866, it was a period of time when the United States was really growing by leaps and bounds. And I'm sorry, I'm, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. I'm getting ahead of probably one of the most significant periods of time in this country for us as a people. I'm talking about the time of beginning in 1846 when Frederick Douglass began a speaking tour in London about the problems that we were confronted with as slaves in this country. Frederick Douglass is probably uh, the first major African-American national political figure in this country. Uh, so significant and prolific was the life of Frederick Douglass, so he was the first African-American to offer himself as a candidate for president of the United States. And in 1846, he began speaking tours throughout Europe, starting in London, to promote his interest in being president of the United States. And probably one of the other significant figures uh, born about 1820, Douglas was born in 1818. In 1820, a young woman was born, uh, a name that you will be very familiar with, and I would imagine that um, given the recent election, within the next two years, uh, this 
young lady's name, even though she is not, she, she is famous now, in, in about two years, she will be rich and famous. And I speak of uh, one of the most prolific names is, uh, in uh, African American history, particularly during this period, and I speak of none other than Harriet Tubman. And um, we know about uh, the significant contributions that Harriet Tubman made as a, a, a hero of us as a people and her efforts to lead the Underground Railroad and uh, take uh, hundreds of former slaves to freedom in the North. Well, I make reference to her financial value because it is my hope and it is the plan of the United States of America, Department of Treasury, to put her face on a $20 bill in the near future. In 1856, was the year that the Dred Scott case went to the Supreme Court. It was finally settled the next year, but uh, it's Dred Scott is an interesting story uh, about um, a slave who uh, was um, originally purchased by a slave owner in Missouri. And then they left Missouri and went to another state that was not a slave state at the time. And um, Dred Scott found out that uh, there was a possibility that since he was in a free state, he could be free. So his, uh, his owner wanted to take him, when his owner found out what his intentions were, the owner wanted to take him back to Missouri so he'd be sure to um, maintain his control over his slave, which he saw as his property. So um, Dred Scott got support from people in the community that he was living in, and they filed a suit. And this suit went all the way to the Supreme Court of the United States. And it was the Supreme Court under the leadership of the Chief Justice Tenney by a decision of seven to two, the Supreme Court of the United States said that he had no standing to uh, even bring his charges before the Supreme Court, that he had no standing that they could found, find in either the Constitution or the Declaration of Independence. And further, they couldn't even figure out how many fifths of a man he was. The, the su Supreme Court of the United States did not even see Dred Scott as a 100% man. Because he was of African descent, he was less than a white man. And what's really significant and, and painful about this case is the fact that it got to the highest court in the land and the highest court in the land could not fairly honestly agree to the fact that this was a human being and he needed to be respected and afforded the rights as written in the document by the founding fathers that all men were created equal. Well, that problem will meet again, and I'll share that with you when we come to it. So that was 1856. In 1860, it marked the end of the Underground Railroad, and it also marked the year of the election of Abraham Lincoln. Within a year after the election of Abraham Lincoln, the Civil War began in 1861. And then in 1863, Abraham Lincoln delivered his Emancipation Proclamation. 
And in 1865, the Civil War ended. And in 1866, the year after the Civil War had ended, in Galveston, Texas, a general by the name of Granger, who had come to Texas on his way to Mexico to fight Mexico, with its estimated over 10,000 soldiers, the majority of whom were black soldiers, arrived in Galveston, Texas, and found that the slaves and Africans enslaved in the area did, had never heard of the Emancipation Proclamation and had not been told that the war was over. So on June 19, 1865, Granger, with the support and the encouragement of the Black armed soldiers who were with him read a statement indicating that slavery had ended, all slaves were free, and there was great joy and celebration. And it was called Celebration Day, Joyous Day, and now has come to be known as Juneteenth, uh, a great celebration that we have each year. Another interesting uh, side note for that same year, 1866, it was the year that the Buffalo Soldiers were established. And today I'm uh, aware of the uh, effort of these two uh, major events and individuals involved with them. Uh, in that we have uh, a big celebration of Juneteenth sponsored by the National Juneteenth Observance Foundation of Nevada, one of our sponsors. And they work very closely with the Buffalo soldiers in this community to celebrate Juneteenth here. That same year, 1866, there was a, a black cowboy who made quite a name for himself one of the most significant of the trailblazers of the wild, wild west was a, a young man by the name of James Pierce Beckworth. And James Pierce, Beck, Pierce Beckworth was originally a, um, a blacksmith and he got into a fight with a white man. And in order to save his life, he ran away and uh, he, he went west. And he was one of the most formidable mountain men uh, of the uh, mid 1800s. Uh, he discovered a path over the Sierra Nevada mountains just west of Reno, Nevada, that um, enabled travelers to pass from. Reno into California, and it's called Beckwith Pass, and it's still in existence now. But as I indicated, he was a great mountain man, and one one of the little known facts about this uh, great African American pioneer and hero was that while when he ran away. He ran away from his life, his family, and everything. So how did he survive? How did he become a hero? Who supported him? Well, he was supported by the Crow Nation. As a matter of fact, so impressed and such a great leader he was while living with the Crow Nation, they named him as the chief of the Crow Nation. So James Pierce Beckworth, one of the great pioneers of the West, uh, a cowboy, a mountain man, um, a, a discoverer, he was also chief of the Crow Nation for a while in the 1800s. 
So we move on to our BK on the sixes, and we look to 1876. And in 1876, it was the last year of Reconstruction. Following the Civil War, which had been a war fought between the North and the South, the primary reason for the Civil War was to end slavery. Slavery was the mechanism that the South had built its economic power structure on. The South was primarily an agrarian community. It primarily focused on plants and growing, a very labor intense process. And one of the ways that Southerners were able to make a fortune and to make a profit on this land was to forcing African slaves to till the soil and grow the crops. One of the first big products was sugar. Uh, that comes when uh, slavery first started uh, in the Caribbean. One of the, the first products uh, that was uh, produced and shipped to Europe was sugar. Then later, by the time the Civil War had come, uh, a wide variety of products were being produced in the South, but probably the most significant of the products was cotton. And the, 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 the North wanted to end slavery. The South said no. The opinion of the minority becomes the opinion of the majority. When this country first started, as I indicated earlier, even states like New York and New Jersey and Vermont, which was the first state to um, condemn slavery, Originally, they were all for it, but then the opinion of the majority at the time was slavery was all right. But then in the process, the opinion of the majority becomes the opinion, the opinion of the minority becomes the opinion of the majority. And the majority of the Northern states began to see the evils of slavery. And because there was no way that that concern could be recognized and ended up with a war. And it was a war uh, at the time our president was Abraham Lincoln. He ended up being assassinated, uh, but the North prevailed. And at the end of the war, 1865, the Union, which was the North, sent soldiers and troops down to the South to see to it that no concerted effort was made by Southerners to maintain and continue their way of life, particularly as it related to slavery. Um, schools were established prior to the Civil War. It was against the law to teach slaves to read and write. Now, many slave owners did teach, a, and a, a probably the most classic example is um, that I've talked about uh, to, at this time was Frederick Douglass, who was a slave whose uh, slave, the slave master's wife taught him how to read and write. And so successful, it was he in his studying of reading and writing that he ended up running for president of the United States. And he, he also wrote uh, a number of great books, Frederick Douglass. So now it's 1876. The troops that had been sent to the South in 1865, after 1865, keep the Southerners in line. By 1876, there was an election, and the shrewd Southerners found a way of manipulating the potential president to be elected in 1876 
The Southerners said, we will support you for the election of president if you end Reconstruction and take the troops out of the South. And in, eight, in January, uh, after the election of 1876, uh, the president ended Reconstruction, withdrew the, tr the, the troops from the South. And as far as I'm concerned, it began really one of the cruelest and most destructive periods, although it's difficult to even think of or consider something that, that was a worse period than the slavery that we had been exposed to in, in the, the previous hundreds of years. But from 1876 to the turn of the century, things became so bad for black life in, to, in, in the United States that uh, black people themselves just rose up and said, we have to do something and make a change. I'll be telling you about that in a moment. But 1876, December, at the, at the end of December and, and the beginning of 1877, um, Reconstruction ends. And this period after 1876 was the period where we saw the, the great rise of the Ku Klux Klan. And what it was was a, an, a re-emergence of that evil and viciousness of racism and hatred uh, that had existed. And the South made every effort to try to go back to where they had been before where they were in control of the Negro and uh, just crushed every facet of our life, but it was too late. And, uh, but they made an effort. They made an effort by lynching as many of us as they could to try to get us to act right. But because of the strong dynamic people we, uh, we were, we prevailed. And by 1896, we began to see the emergence of leaders who want to make a change and make a difference. Uh, and uh, I select the year 1896 in our BK on the sixes because in 1896, the year before, Booker T. Washington had made his famous speech, as a matter of fact, it was at the Atlanta Cotton Exposition of 1895, and it was the first time that a black man had ever made an address to a large assemblage of white people in the South. And it was the Atlanta Cotton Exposition of 1895, and Booker T. Washington made his presentation. And the most significant part of his presentation was how he described us the people of the United States as a hand with five fingers. And each of the races represented uh, one of the fingers. And the only way the hand worked properly and most productively was when it used all of the fingers. Well, of course, uh, if you don't know the story of uh, Booker T. Washington, uh, he is a very interesting figure. Uh, he did a number of positive things, but uh, there are a lot of people who didn't like his, his methods. Um, 1896, though, is the year that I'm focusing in on at this time, because once again, as I had indicated in 1856, the Supreme Court of the United States the highest court in our land had dropped the ball. Well, in 1896, mm -hmm. the Supreme Court again had an opportunity to right the ship of America, to set us on the true meaning of our creed that all men are created equal. And again, the Supreme Court of the United States failed. Uh, the story was uh, of a young man named Homer Plessy. And Homer Plessy was a fair-skinned black man. And he lived 
uh, in Ponchatoula, which is across the Lake Pontchartrain for New Orleans. And he was a businessman. And every morning he would catch the train and ride from uh, the north shore of Lake Pontchartrain down to New Orleans. Well, the train had a car for white. And in the back, there was a car for Negroes. Well, one day, and by design, this was not an accident. Uh, this was um, an activist move by uh, Homer Plessy, and he had support. Homer Plessy went into the white car, and the conductor recognized Plessy and told him he had to go to the back car. He refused. When the train arrived in New Orleans, he was arrested. And he was charged with civil disobedience and uh, disrespect for the laws that said that um, black folks were supposed to get back. So this case went all the way to the Supreme Court. And the judge in the in the initial case was uh, a judge named Ferguson. And the case made its way all the way to the Supreme Court. And the basic issue to the Supreme Court was, if all men are created equal, then they should be afforded all public accommodations that's offered to, to its citizens. And the Supreme Court refused to accept the separate but equal and said that, well, there's a car in the black in the back for colored, and we're not going to uh, uh, uphold this case. And so the Supreme Court once again dropped the ball, and we had to wait another 50 years before we found a Supreme Court that would do something constructive to help black citizens live out the true meaning of the creed of this country. So this, the Plessy Ferguson case was 1896. So here we are knocking at the door of the 20th century. I'm not gonna go too deep in the 20th century because most of those of you in the sound of my voice were actually born in the 20th century. Like myself, I was born before the middle of the 20th century. So uh, I'm, I'm confident that uh, the largest part of my, my listeners were born in the 20th century uh, and are, are a little more familiar, particularly with the uh, the age of civil rights of the 60s. But I'd like to just go a little into the, the 20th century to one particular uh, part of the 20th century that I'm particularly fond of that I want to share with you. So as I continue with BK on the 60s, and that is before Kwanzaa, before Kwanzaa on the 60s, that's what BK on the 60s means. I start in 1906. And in 1906, the rage in this country among black folks was a book that was published in 1903 by a young man of William Edward Burkholz Du Bois. He was probably, at the time, one of the most highly educated African Americans in this country. Uh, he was. Uh, uh, the first black to graduate from Harvard with a doctor's degree. He studied in Europe and was a very profound and uh, prolific educator. And uh, among his uh, contributions was uh, a book he wrote called The Soul of Black Folks. And it was the soul of black folks that was the talk of the town in 1906. And from his writings came a group that organized, they called themselves the Niagara Movement. And the Niagara Movement was primarily led by W.E.B. Du Bois and William Trotter, who was a newspaper editor. There were about 
a dozen um, key black national leaders who came together and under the leadership of W.B. Du Bois, who had trouble with Booker T. Washington and his message, W.B. Du Bois felt that we as black people needed to begin to say to America that we are a people of value and worth. In, in his writings, uh, he says that um, there, there is a two-ness about the American Negro and that we should not divorce our African ancestry from our American heritage. And so he said in order for us to really emerge as, a, as the dynamic people that we have been in the past, we need to begin to, first of all, study our past and know and understand who we are. And at the same time, we need to show to America that we are a people of dignity and worth. Well, the, the Niagara Movement only lasted a short time, a few years. And about five years after the Niagara Movement was established, it led to a broader national organization that came to be known as the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, and that was in 1909. A year later, the, the Urban League was established. So here we are moving in, in a more positive direction. First, we see cooperative organizations, black people and white people coming together to do something constructive to improve the lot of African Americans. We move along to the next six on our chart, and that's 1916, and it's the Great Migration. The Great Migration actually began in 1910 and lasted till 1920. Following the Civil War and after Reconstruction, Black people who had been slaves on plantations in the South found that after Reconstruction that there were really no real opportunities for them in the South. So they, be they began a migration from the South to the north. And researchers have developed patterns which show people lived in, um, in Mississippi and Louisiana, went north to Tennessee and the people, then some people from Tennessee, Louisiana, and Mississippi went up to Chicago, and people from Florida and Georgia got on trains and started heading north. And there's a story that um, they, were, they knew where they were going, and they heard the conductor say, Newark! And they all got off the train, but later on they found out they were in Newark, New Jersey, but they were really heading for New York. And the Great Migration began. And with the Great Migration, the dreams and programs that had been begun by the Niagara Movement and supported by the NAACP began to come to fruition, and they did. They came to fruition in 1926 in a section of New York that's called Harlem. And it was the place and time when Black America showed its most creative kuumba to the world, and it was called the Harlem Renaissance. And I'm going to conclude tonight, or today, with today's presentation, with a little synopsis of the Harlem Renaissance. It was indeed the time when Black America said to the world that we are not just a people of dignity of, and worth but we are good at art, 
painting, scripture, literature, movies, music, politics, religion, athletics, spiritual, and philosophical. And black Americans began to excel with the help of some of the key luminaries of the Harlem Renaissance. Probably the two most prolific were Langston Hughes and Zora Neale Hurston. They were salesmen. They, they were both artists in their own right, but they were salesmen of the Harlem Renaissance. And they were the, they were the people who went to the Carnegie's, the Mellons, the Rockefellers, uh, the J.P. Morgan's, all the, the, the big money people, and asked them to put up money to support the development of black art. And beginning around 1920, there was an emergence. And I, I'm going to just share with you some of the names of the key luminaries of the Harlem Renaissance period. Some of the names you, most of the names you should be familiar with because of their legacy and contribution continues to this day. And of course, we start with W.E.B. Du Bois and his soul of black folks. James Weldon Johnson, uh, lift every voice and sing. Elaine Locke, Elaine Locke was both a contemporary of W.E.B. Du Bois. And what was unique about Elaine Locke who was uh, uh, an activist and a writer in, in himself. He wrote a book uh, during the Harlem Renaissance called The New Negro. Elaine Locke was the first African-American to be named a Rhodes Scholar. And that is one of the highest honors, academic honors that you can achieve in the United States, being named um, a Rhodes Scholar. It enables you to go to study in Europe. It's a, a very prestigious accomplishment. Well, Elaine Locke was one of the uh, activists and leaders of the Harlem Renaissance, and um, I pay tribute to him, Ashe, as we call his name, as one of the ancestors. And if we were poor in libations, we'd be calling these names. Uh, Claude McKay, a poet, Jack Johnson, a fighter, Paul Robeson, an actor and singer, Adam Clayton Power, senior, a politician, Marcus Garvey. Marcus Garvey was one of the prominent leaders of the Black Nationalist Movement in the United States. So significant and profound that he had a parade through the streets of Harlem with over 10,000 people uh, in his Back to Africa movement. And if you'd like to read a very interesting story about a very interesting man, he was very well educated. He was a product of the British system of education, which is different from ours. And he was from uh, Jamaica. Study Marcus Garvey, I shake. Langston Hughes, Zora Neale Hurston, Jean Toomer, Coty Cullen, all artists, poets, and writers. Carter G. Woodson, Duke Ellington, Arna Botemp, Claude McKay, Louis Armstrong, King Oliver, Jelly Roll Martin, Josephine Baker, William Grant Still, considered the father of black composers. Ethel Waters. James Van Der Zee, a photographer. These names represent the Kuumba of us as American people because they were the artists and artisans of the Harlem Renaissance who stepped forward to show the product of their creative ability. And the, the Harlem Renaissance period was called the Jazz Age. And it, it was called the period when the Negro was in vogue. So it was a very significant period in our time. And as a historian, I see, based on the time that we are living in now and 
the the effects of the coronavirus on our society that as i look back the united states had another serious more serious uh, 750,000 people died in the uh, pandemic of 1919. And I pray God we don't near that number with this virus. But after the country overcame the ills, the physical ills of the pan that pandemic, the Harlem Renaissance emerged. And I see a potential emergence again, not just history repeating itself, but even in a more significant and profound way, because I have every confidence in the present political administration that's about to take office, that they will make a concerted effort to address the problem of racism and really maybe for the first time begin to work toward helping us to live out the true meaning of the creed of this country, that all men are created equal. I thank you for your time tonight. This has been the celebration of Kuumba, the sixth principle of Nguzu Zaba during our Kwanzaa celebrations. Our next program We'll focus on the final principle, Imani. And the primary focus of that presentation will be toward children. And Dr. Karinga, when he originally established Kwanzaa, emphasized the importance of involving children in the celebration. Because, and we see now this year we are celebrating the 54th anniversary of Kwanzaa. And Kwanzaa now is celebrated on every continent on the face of the earth. So because of the, the popularity and acceptance of Kwanzaa around the world, we are beginning to set a pattern. And I, 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 I continue to read negative comments and oratories about our celebration. Let the negative be negative. We have to be positive. We cannot expect any individual organization or institution to do for us what we must do for ourselves. So we move forward. Tomorrow we will celebrate uh, the final principle of our Kwanzaa celebration that is usually conducted uh, or is conducted uh, the, the last week of the year from December 26th till January 1st. Join us when we have our final celebration of Imani. On behalf of the Samuel L. Smith Educational Foundation and the National Juneteenth Observance Foundation of Nevada, thank you for your time today. I'm your host, Dr. Al Gurrier.